Welcome to Thought Crime and Keto Crime, where Tracy does the sleuthing so you don't have to. Hey everyone, welcome to Keto and Crime and Thought Crime. Today I have a very special video for you. I'm coming to you live from my porch. So you'll probably hear some birds chirping, maybe a rooster crow. There's a rooster down the road that loves to crow even when it's broad daylight. So I don't understand that, but um, we're packing to go on a, uh, a vacation. So the house is kind of hustle bustle right now. So this is the only place I could find that was kind of private. So anyway, today we're going to take a look at this affidavit that was released uh, a few days ago from uh, Madison County, Idaho, prosecuting attorney Rob H. Wood. This is an affidavit that basically outlines how the uh, the local police and the uh, Idaho Bureau of Investigation and the FBI knew to search the Daybell residence in Idaho for the bodies of J.J. and Tylee. This outlines specifically the location of Alex Cox, Lori Vallow's brother, who played a pivotal part in this whole saga and is now deceased, uh, supposedly, allegedly, maybe of natural causes. Uh, that remains to be seen. I really hope they do exhume his body and do an autopsy. But this shows that he may have played an even greater role in the disappearance of Tylee and JJ than was first suspected. And I don't think that really comes as a shock, but basically uh, the, F the local law authorities and FBI, Idaho Bureau of Investigation used GPS tracking in Alex's cell phone to pinpoint his exact location in the month of September 2019, the months that JJ and Tylee were last seen and supposedly disappeared and were probably had their lives taken. So, without further ado, let's get into it. All right, as the affidavit starts, it's just affirmed by the investigating officer, Rob Wood, that he attained all this information through various sources. Number one, the factual record of what happened. Two, Alex's GPS locator in his cell phone and also an interview with uh, Melanie Gibb and her then boyfriend, David Warwick, when uh, he went to visit them in Utah. That's how he got a lot of this background information. So it just starts with kind of a review of what they're doing, looking for J.J. Vallow, date of birth 5-25-2012, and Tylee, date of birth 9-24-2002, minor children of Lori Vallow, and stepchildren to Chad Daybell, who have been reported missing since September of 2019. Also, he goes on to say that uh, Lori failed to produce them for a welfare check in November or in January of 2020, and she was since in prison for neglect and abandonment. And then they turned their attention toward Chad Daybell, who as of yet had not been you know, put forth as a potential suspect, at least by means of actual evidence. I mean, everybody kind of knew maybe he was involved, but, you know. He then goes on to rehash how they were, how Jad, Chad Daybell was present in Hawaii when Lori Vallow was taken into custody, and how he did not offer any help or solution to the matter. So let's first start with September 8th, 2019. This was literally the last time that Tylee was seen by anyone. It was a, in a picture at Yellowstone National Park with Alex Cox and her mother Lori Vallow, and she was not seen any time after that. But what we do know, according to Alex Cox's cell phone GPS record, the next morning after midnight of September 9th, 2019, we can see clearly that Alex moved from his own apartment, which for when they first moved to Idaho, Alex lived with them in their little townhouse apartment, but then he moved to his own about a two minute walk from them in the same complex. So we see his GPS move from his apartment to Lori's apartment and ping there 
from approximately 2.47 a.m. to about 3.15 a.m. the morning of September 9th. So the very early morning of the day after Tylee was last seen. Then we see him ping on the Daybell property from just after 9 a.m. to just after 11 a.m. that same day. Also that same day, we have text records coming from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow saying that he had an interesting morning, that he was burning some brush behind the barn near the fence and a raccoon jumped out of a tree and was running along the fence and he said he felt the need to shoot it and then bury it in the pet cemetery in the yard. Now Tammy, before she passed away, was a huge lover of animals and she actually had a pet cemetery on their property near the pond where they would bury the farm animals, pets, animals that she would find dead or dying and she would bury them there. So this was just a very strange thing for Chad to text Lori with the preface that I had an interesting morning. Now you can draw your own conclusions from that, but the GPS locator in Alex's cell phone pinged him from just after 9 a.m. on September 9th to, ju to just after 11 a.m. on September 9th in the area behind the barn near the fence on the Daybell property where Chad says this incident with the raccoon occurred. Now, was this a code? I don't know, but it sounds suspicious to me. And I hope that's something that they investigate. But it is all allegedly and conjecture. Now, one thing you need to know about the cast system they use to monitor these GPS is it's effective within six meters. And if you know that, that's within about within about five four to five feet in the English system in feet. So it's very accurate. So within, you know, less than 10, 10 feet, it can predict where he was actually standing. And it did put him behind the barn near the fence for this time period. And I can tell you on June 9th that, pe that neighbors of the Daybells confirmed that there was a bonfire that day near the fence, which was very unusual. Some of the neighbors also questioned because raccoons are nocturnal animals, they only come out at night, why a raccoon would suddenly make a wild play down the fence for him to be able to shoot it. So it was confirmed there was a, a fire of some sort behind the Daybell barn between those hours on June 9th and on, on uh, excuse me, on September 9th, 2019. Now, June 9th, 2020, when authorities found the bodies the body of Tylee Ryan was found behind the barn near the fence, had been partially decapitated and also burned. So there you go. Also in interviews with Melanie Gibb, Melanie also mentioned that just before Tylee disappeared, when, uh, when Lori and Chad started telling everybody that Tylee had gone on to college, you know, at a uh, Brigham Young there in Idaho, that she also felt that Tylee had become a zombie. And she said that this went all the way back. Lori took it all the way back to when Tylee was 13 and 14 and didn't want to babysit um, JJ. That And would also be kind of rebellious, you know, like teenagers do. She said that, in her opinion, based on Chad Daybell's zombie chart, and yes, he had a zombie chart. I've read it. It's kind of hard for me to put it up here for you, but basically he had different levels of zombies ranging from one up to like a 4.2, and basically once a zombie crossed 2.5, they were unredeemable. And according to Melanie Gibb, Lori was saying that way back when Tylee was 13 and 14 and was kind of a rebellious preteen or teen, that she had crossed past 2.5 on this scale, even though she didn't know it then, and had progressed on since, and that Tylee was indeed a zombie. And Melanie remembers her saying this on the phone and hearing Tylee in the background actually scream, no mom, not me. So we know that there was a foundation laid for Tylee being unredeemable in their eyes, an obstacle to their mission to clear the world of zombies and lead the 144,000 into the end times, 
And so that leads us to a probable motive for the death of Tylee Ryan. Now, what happened with JJ? Well, we already know from previous investigations and previous interviews with Melanie Gibb and, and now her boyfriend, David Warwick, who was here this particular weekend, that Chad and Lori had already started to say that JJ was becoming a zombie. The weekend of September 22nd, 23rd, September 22nd was the last time that anyone saw JJ alive, and it was by Melanie Gibb and David Warwick in his mother's apartment in Idaho. It was on that day that Lori told Melanie and David that JJ had become a zombie, past 2.5 on Chad's range of charts, and that she knew this because he was becoming increasingly hostile, he was climbing up on cabinets. He was sitting in a, in a zombie-like catatonic state watching television and even said at one time that he loved Satan. And it was from that reason that she thought he had become a zombie and was unredeemable. Okay, let's break this down. First of all, J.J. was autistic. So it's nothing unusual for an autistic boy to have an outburst of temper. We know this because... JJ actually had a service dog that was taken from him and was on Respiradol, which is a drug that is used to calm fits in both schizophrenics and autistic people. So he was on Respiradol and he also had a service dog. Now let's also go over the timeline. Okay, so JJ had the service dog that he was very close to. And it was ripped from him the last of August. So that's traumatic. Then the first part of September, he has moved away from the house he has shared with his family, including his just shot and murdered father at the hands of his uncle, to a strange state that he's never been in before. And now all of a sudden, this other man, Chad Daybell, has suddenly taken a huge part in his life and is sharing in probably the religious delusion that both he and Tylee have noticed in their mother. So yes, he's under a lot of undue stress. Plus, Melanie Gibb also confirmed that there were unused bottles of his Respiradol found in both Lori and Chad and Alex's apartment that had that still had about 17 pills in them left from earlier in the year. Now, so his service dog is gone, he's had all these traumatic events, and now evidently perhaps his medicine is not being utilized properly, even though Melanie did testify that occasionally Lori would overdrug him to put him to bed early to get a break. So all these things are happening, and she wonders why this kid is acting out. So I would say that the fact that he was sitting in front of the television quietly every once in a while is probably a gift. and. The fact he was acting out and maybe even saying things like I love Satan might be because he's angry and upset about the, all the religious fervor and religious fanaticism that he's being exposed to. And maybe he's doing it just to get under your skin, Lori. It doesn't mean he's a zombie and unredeemable. But that's the story that Melanie Gibb and David Warwick relayed to Agent Hobb during this affidavit. Now, let's move on to September 20. Third, when they they were staying with their good friends Lori, they woke up Melanie and David, and actually before they left, said they wanted to say goodbye to JJ, and that's when Lori summed it up by saying, "He's not here. He's a zombie. He's with Alex," referring to her brother Alex Cox, who lived very close. Also during that period that they were staying with them, September nineteenth to September twenty third, two thousand nineteen. Melanie recalls a day that Lori and Chad were going to record a podcast and JJ was acting out, so Alex came over and got him. And when he returned him that night, he was asleep with his head placed over on Alex's shoulder. Now, but they did see him later on September 22nd, but September 23rd, when they woke up and asked to say goodbye to him, they were told he's a zombie, he's with Alex. And then after they left, they really didn't think any more of it. And then later that day, Alex Cox GPS pinged him at Chad Daybell's property from about 9.15 a.m. to about 
10, 15 a.m. that morning near the pet cemetery, near the pond. And it was there on June 9th that JJ's body was found, wrapped in plastic and duct taped, buried in that same general area. And so that's pretty much what this affidavit reveals as far as we're concerned. There was some other stuff about Alex being at Del Taco and some other places along this time, but what it really brings out is just how deep the delusion of her children being zombies Laurie Daybell had dropped into, and the location of Alex Cox. On the, de the days after, the last day either of her children were seen, and then later on where the bodies were found in those exact same places. So, I am really anxious to see what happens here and what J Chad Daybell's part in it was, what Lori's part was, was, and Alex Cox, because I think he has a, definitely has a lot more to do with it than is being let on, and I would like to know if he actually died of natural causes or not. But that's where I'm going to leave off on this video. I hope you enjoyed this. I will be back next weekend, this weekend, with uh, books three, two and three of Chad Daybell's Standing on Holy Ground series. I was able to find a couple of them used and also borrowed one. And I did pay for one of them, but it's a grand total of $3 going into Chad Daybell's pocket. So I really don't feel too bad. But I am going to read those over the rest of the week and have a full review for you in my next two or three videos. So I hope you'll enjoy that. And then I'll be back with other true crimes stories. I hope you're enjoying this. I surely am enjoying having conversations about things that interest me with all you guys. I really appreciate all the new subscribers. Uh, if there's any cases you want me to cover, let me know down below. You can also support the channel. Links are down below. But the most important thing you can do is hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm and share, share, share. Thank you so much, guys. And until next time, keto come.